I see a couple of viewers out there already. We're going to take a few more minutes, but uh, we'll try to get started about five after or so. That gives people time to get logged on, get lost on the internet a little bit, and then uh, finally get where they're supposed to be. Uh, so we'll take a few minutes. <clears throat> <laughs> Got that right, Brenda. It starts at six. No excuses. Another minute or so. All right, we'll go ahead and, and get started. It's good to have everybody uh, on tonight. Uh, it's like I'm saying, about five people that are on. Um, and that'll, Lord willing, that'll uh, they'll have more come on as we get a little bit closer into it. 
Uh, for prayer time tonight, I want to look at Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number one, starting in verse number 15. Ephesians 1, 15. And this is not an uncommon scripture and one that we have used in the past uh, to start our prayer time. And I just want to take the time to, to look at it once again. Uh, I've looked at it a lot over the last uh, several days. Uh, and wanted to share it with uh, with you before we uh, move to our prayer time. I do have some prayer requests that, that have been sent in, uh, either via email or via text, and I'll go over those uh, momentarily. But Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 15. And I kind of bring you up to, to speed on where this is. Uh, I know that we in the, the men's Sunday school class, we spent a lot of time on Ephesians chapter number one and, and over and over again, looking at uh, verses three down through verse number 14. Um, I'm going through uh, uh, Romans now, of course, and, and uh, looking in Romans eight and uh, considering the, the work of the spirit and uh, keeps being drawing me back to verses number 13 and 14, all of the blessings, the spiritual blessings that have been given to us in Christ. And then once he has given us, uh, reminded us of those spiritual blessings of who we are in Christ, he then goes on to verse number 15 and begins to explain or expound uh, upon his prayer. So verse number 15, he says, For this reason, all those blessings that we have, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as a head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Now let's look over to chapter number three as well. <clears throat> After he continues to expound in chapter number two, uh, we know those great verses of salvation uh, by grace through faith, that he has raised us from the dead. And then going on toward the end of chapter number three in verse number 14, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, verse number 18, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. These are two very uh, important prayers uh, that we see Paul offering. And both of them deal with having our understanding enlightened. Both of them deal with knowing God more and the fullness of God and understanding, comprehending his love. Um, we go back to that hinge in Romans chapter number one that people knew God. Uh, they had no excuse. They could look at the creation around them and realize the Godhead and his power, but yet they did not glorify him as God. And they exchanged God for a, for a lie, exchanging him for a, uh, for a creation image in their own uh, image, uh, in their own creation. So it is key for us to know who God is. Uh, to know his sovereignty, to know his power, to know his love, to know his mercy, to know his wrath, uh, to know all of his attributes, not just pick and choose the one that we like, but know him in his fullness. Uh, and as we have gone through these last uh, these last several days, 
uh, and weeks uh, going back to the, the pandemic uh, and the, the quarantining and, and the change of lifestyle and, and how we function as a society. Uh, and then moving on to the events of Sunday night and the storms that happened. Um, you know, I'm hoping and praying that, that as, as we have tried to digest all of these things and, and tried to sit back and, and just comprehend everything that has happened to, to us as a society, uh, especially here locally, uh, with regard to the pandemic and, and, uh, and the, the tragic events on Sunday night, that we do take the time to consider who God is, um, that we truly recognize his sovereign power and we recognize his grace and recognize his mercy, uh, that every time we get up and every time we breathe, every time that, uh, that we have breath in our lungs, that it is all part of his mercy and all part of his grace, uh, that, that we are subject to, to, to the wrath that, that he brings upon, upon the creation, upon mankind, that we ourselves could have been the ones that were lost uh, in a, or killed in a tornado. We ourselves are ones that, uh, that could, and maybe even the days ahead may even suffer from uh, this pandemic or any other disease. But to recognize the grace and mercy that God has uh, given unto us and recognize his power and recognize his salvation once again. So these events that have taken place and other events that happen in the future, don't, don't just brush them off and don't just uh, consider them from a spectator st standpoint, uh, but take the time to consider God's work. You know, all things work together for good the, for those that, that love God, those that are called according to his purpose. And that good, of course, is the conforming of, of us to the image of his son, uh, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So everything that happens, be it good or be it bad, all of these things are, are God's working uh, for our favor, that we will be conformed into his image. So I hope that, uh, that we do take the time to consider these things uh, and, and the events that have taken place. Uh, in the last you know, 48, 72 hours, uh, as well as the pandemic, and regardless of how what direction it goes, whether it gets better, whether it doesn't, uh, that we'll consider God and, and consider his sovereign hand in all the things that, that have taken place. Uh, because in the end, it's all about his glory. It's all about him getting glory. Uh, whether good things happen to us, and we recognize that mercy, and even in judgment, uh, even in the bad things, that, that God gets glory in those things as well because he is God. So, uh, but with those thoughts in mind, let's take a moment to look at uh, our prayer request list that, that I have written down here. And people have either texted me or they have emailed either myself or, uh, or Rhonda, and I have uh, got them written down here. Um, and let me say this uh, uh, moving forward before we get into the, to the to prayer and Bible study. Um, if you have questions uh, as we're going through the study, uh, please feel free to text. Uh, my number is in the uh, the bulletin. I won't give it out this time, but um, numbers in the bulletin. You can you can text me. That is fine. Uh, just recognize there is a delay. Uh, it's a several second delay. Uh, so don't if I don't answer right away, or if I keep reading, or it looks like I just keep read, keep on reading. Uh, I'll see it, and I will I will eventually get to it. Especially if it's, if it's a quick question that we can answer quickly. Uh, if it's something that you want to wait and hold off until the end, write it down, jot it down, and feel free to call me afterward or text me at the end. Uh, if it's going to take a little bit of time for me to maybe elaborate on it. Or if you want to kind of get your thoughts together and, and text me or call me tomorrow, that's fine as well. Uh, I'm available, you know, throughout the week. Uh, I get texts throughout the week from, from different people asking questions. Um, so so please don't don't uh, don't hesitate to do that as, as well. And also, let me just kind of point these things out. You may see me. I noticed it last week. Uh, you may see me from time to time either looking at my watch or looking at my phone. If you if you see me do that, that's not uh, me trying to be rude. Uh, if someone's trying to text me or whatever else, or I'm carrying another conversation. But if there is a question <coughs> and then someone texts me, I do want to look at my phone to see what it is. And a lot of times it might not be a question. It might be some uh, a conversation from that has nothing to do with, with the Bible study, somebody from work or something else. Uh, but also my my wife, Rhonda, she got me a uh, smart watch for my birthday back in February. And one thing I noticed last week is as part of this smart watch is it checks my heart rate and it lets me know when, when I'm working out. Like if I go walk around the neighborhood uh, about 10 minutes into it, it recognizes that my heart rate is a little elevated and it's been consistent. It says, hey, there's a workout detected. 
you know, starts measuring how far I walk, how many calories I burn, those kind of things. I noticed last week, uh, as I was teaching, I kept looking at my watch and it wasn't trying to check the time or trying to be rude, but I noticed that, uh, I guess my heart rate gets elevated when I'm teaching. And I recognize that, uh, um, that it was picking it up as a workout. Uh, so I burned a lot of calories last Wednesday night. Uh, so if you see me do that, I'm, tripling, I'm not trying to be, to be rude, but it does ding. I want to make sure that it's not uh, somebody trying to text me or get a hold of me that, that may have a, have a quick question. So just be, a, be aware of that. But let's look at the prayer request for tonight. Um, Sister Hickman did email uh, just a few moments ago, just before I got online. Uh, she is suffering from a sore throat and a headache and is uh, and is significantly weak. Uh, so let's remember, uh, Sister Hickman, in your prayers, nothing more than that. And I don't want to speculate or anything at that point, but let's uh, let's continue. Let's keep uh, Sister Hickman in your prayers as well as Gary and his brother. Of course, he suffered that stroke last week. I haven't heard anything new from from uh, from uh, from brother uh, Gary or his brother. But let's remember them in in in, uh, in our prayers and, and that God would. Uh, be glorified, that they would be patient uh, with the treatments, uh, with the doctors, understanding that our healthcare physicians uh, are completely overwhelmed with what's going on, uh, either with the illnesses or else or with the new structure and, and dynamics as to how they have to perform their duties. So I know it's very frustrating to them. So let's uh, pray that we'll have some patience in, in those situations as well. Uh, Deacon Morgan texted earlier. And he has a nephew in Texas that is suffering from uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19. And he has asked us to uh, to pray for him uh, and that God would strengthen him and heal his body. Uh, so let's uh, remember him in prayer. Sister Harrington, um, there is a tree that is threatening to fall uh, in, her, in her yard, and she is trying to get that corrected. And not just her, but uh, several that uh, in, our, in our church family, some that have been mentioned, some that have not. Uh, that may have had some home damage. I don't know of any injury or anything like that uh, from our church family as we were trying to get some information on Monday and just sending some messages out, just trying to to gain what happened if anybody had uh, suffered any damage. We know that the uh, Walkers had a house, had a tree fall in their house and also the Longs, I believe, had a tree fall in theirs and they're down here in the, in the Fort Oglethorpe area. Uh, but in any case, um, just let's be thankful to, to God that... Uh, um, you know, for his mercy towards so many, uh, and let's be compassionate toward those that are going through a difficult time, uh, be it those that, that may have suffered loss of life, that are those that are suffering, uh, uh, damage to property. Uh, let's be compassionate to them. Let's look for opportunities and pray for opportunities to, to, to help, uh, and to be compassionate toward those and to be, be bold. I wrote down to be bold in our love toward uh, others. We heard the message on Sunday about extravagant love. Um, so let's let, let's be bold uh, in that when we when we have opportunity to help one another out, uh, be it within the household of faith or or, or, or somewhere else, uh, be it with regard to the tornadoes or be it with regard to uh, the virus or any other situation, we have an opportunity to to sacrifice ourselves and to help in any way whatsoever. Let's be bold and let's be extravagant uh, about it. Um, but uh, overall, regard in all of these situations, uh, from illness and sickness uh, that we see, and, and the destruction of the tornadoes, um, let's continue to pray for revival. Let's pray for repentance uh, within uh, His church. Um, that we would see His hand in all of this. That we would be brought to a place of humility, recognizing uh, the call that is that is, uh, that is on our life, and recognizing His sovereignty in all things. Uh, and recognizing that he is in control. Uh, so let's do, let's do pray for, for that God would grace us with repentance. Uh, continue to pray for the elders of, of the church as we are trying to go through the training that uh, we were supposed to meet yesterday. Uh, but the uh, tornado has put a halt on that as there's so many that are trying to work through some of the rubble. But hopefully that training will pick up next week. Continue to pray for our government leaders at all levels. Uh, as you know, hopefully and prayerfully, we're we are coming out of this uh, this virus and the, and the the pandemic is starting to peak. Uh, curve is starting to flatten, as the words that we hear. But let's pray that uh, let's pray for our leaders. They're trying to make decisions, um, and they're taking a lot of murmuring and groaning. And I use those words uh, specifically 
uh, because that sounds a lot like what the Israelites were doing in, in the wilderness. Uh, these servants uh, are mayors, are city councilmen, are governors, um, are president. They are human like we are. They are fallible like we are. Uh, and they are God's servants, according to Roman thir Romans 13. So we need to pray for them. Uh, we need to ask that God would give them wisdom and the decisions uh, that are to be made. Uh, none of them are easy. There's going to be criticism no matter what de what decisions are made uh, as we hopefully begin to open up the economy a little bit, hopefully in the weeks and months to come. Uh, we just pray that God would give them wisdom and give us patience and give all of us patience uh, during this time. And then also, and we'd already mentioned it, but let's remember our medical staffs, uh, doctors and nurses uh, here locally, uh, as well as nationwide. Uh, they have a, if, even if it's if it's not completely overwhelming at this point, uh, maybe locally here in, in Chattanooga, like it is in New York or in some larger metropolitan areas, the changes they are having to go through um, with regard to uh, processes and methods and protocols uh, with the new virus, uh, I know it's difficult. I know it's very trying and taxing on them. Uh, so let's make sure that we keep them uh, in our prayers as well, that God will give them wisdom and guidance and grant them patience uh, during this time. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will go back to our Bible study in uh, the epistle to Jude. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessings of life that you have given each and every one of us, Lord. Uh, we take it for granted. Uh, we, we simply, we do. We simply take these things for granted. Lord. We wake up and we go about our day and we don't give consideration, Lord, that uh, the fact that we were able to wake up in the morning was, was by your grace and by your mercy. And Lord, uh, time and time again, Lord, over the last few weeks and last few days, uh, Lord, you have reached out to get our attention, uh, Lord, to recognize uh, your sovereign hand and to recognize that you will bless whom you will bless and you will have mercy on whom you will have mercy and you will, you will bring wrath and judgment upon whom you will bring wrath and judgment. Lord, you are sovereign and Lord, you are in control. Lord, so I pray that you would work upon our hearts. Grant us repentance, Lord, that we would turn from our arrogance, Lord, that we would turn from our flippancy, uh, Lord, turn from our lukewarmness, Lord, and recognize your sovereign hand and recognize the, the call that is upon our life, Lord, the purpose as to why you've saved us, uh, Lord, that we might live holy and we might live blameless, Lord, that you might stir us, uh, Lord, to, to continue in, 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 your, in the faith and to grow in the faith, uh, Lord, in, in a discipleship. Uh, Lord, in the things that you have called us to do, Lord, just continue to encourage us, draw us to repentance, um, not just here at, at our church at Resurrected, but Lord, churches all across the, the U.S. and across the area and across the world. Lord, I pray that you would move upon the hearts of men, move upon the hearts of women, Lord, uh, that there will be a revival, that you would grace us with repentance, Lord, to turn back from our wicked ways. Lord, we do thank you for our government leaders, Lord, we pray for them. I pray that you would give them wisdom uh, or discernment regarding the decisions they have to make. Lord, there's so many things they have to consider. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would simply place upon them, Lord, not a fear of man, but a fear of you. Lord, that they would do what is obedient and right in your sight. Lord, that you would stir their hearts to seek your face, Lord, to seek your wisdom, Lord, to seek your word. Lord, and to understand your word, uh, Lord, as these decisions are made, Lord, grant us to be patient with our government leaders, and Lord, grant them to be patient with us, Lord, that we be patient with one another, Lord, in these different, these difficult and trying times. Lord, we pray for our medical workers. Lord, I pray that you would just grant them peace, uh, allow them time to rest. Lord, uh, locally, Lord, we haven't seen an overwhelming number of cases of, of the virus. Uh, but Lord, you know what could happen in the future. But either way, Lord, the, the protocols have changed and the processes have changed, and that can be frustrating and taxing uh, upon all levels of our healthcare professionals. So I pray that you would give them wisdom and peace and patience, uh, Lord, during this time. Help them to be content uh, with, with where they are and what you have done. 
And Lord, we pray for the leaders of our church. Lord, continue to be with uh, Pastor Jax. And Lord, uh, as, as he continues to minister, especially during this difficult time, so many of our members, Lord, suffer some type of damage, uh, once again, from the storms that, that came through on, on Sunday night. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just be with our leaders, be with our deacons, Lord, as 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 we reach to meet those needs and and uh, just give them the the capacity, Lord, to do what is asked, uh, be it time or be it uh, talent or or treasure, whatever it may be, Lord, that is needed. Lord, grant them that ability. Lord, I pray for these prayer requests that have been mentioned uh, to us tonight. Be with Sister Hickman, Lord. We don't know what her the situation is with her health. But, Lord, she has symptoms. Lord, she, is, or she has a sore throat and a headache. And, Lord, she's not feeling well. She's feeling weak. Lord, I pray to her strength in her body. Uh, be with her. Be with Gary, Lord, as he tends to her. Uh, and, Lord, continue to strengthen Gary's brother and, and, and his health, Lord, who suffered the stroke mm-hmm. last week. Lord, I pray for... Um, Lord, I pray for Sister Hickman and all of these that have suffered loss, uh, the walkers and the longs, uh, damages. Lord, grant them patience. And Lord, within those uh, damages, there's opportunity. There's opportunity for them to know, uh, to, to meet others, to see others. Lord, for them to show their peace and to show their contentment. Uh, Lord, and to share the love of, of God to, to those whom, whom they come in contact with. Lord, so in all these tragedies, Lord, that, that we see on the news and all these tragedies that we see even in our neighborhood, Lord, there's opportunity there, Lord, for you to be glorified. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be bold in our faith, help us to be bold in our actions, Lord, as we have these opportunities to, to, to show compassion on one another. And, Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, grant us peace and grant us to be content, Lord, with whatever situation you have placed us in, knowing that your hand is sovereign. Uh, Lord, whatever the, the government rules say, whatever the medical rules say, Lord, whatever the next thing is that we wake up to tomorrow, Lord, grant us, Lord, to be content as the Apostle Paul was content. Lord, knowing that we can all do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, it is you are our sovereign power. Lord, you are the way, you are, you are how things are accomplished. Lord, so grant us to have peace and grant us to be content. Lord, open up our hearts tonight, Lord, as we look once again to the epistle of Jude. Uh, Lord, as we consider discipleship and, and discipleship in light of the epistle of, of Jude, Lord, so shed light upon our hearts. Give us a spirit of understanding and wisdom, Lord, that we might know your truth, Lord, that we might apply your truth to our lives, Lord, that uh, you might give us uh, direction and, and discernment, Lord, in the days ahead. And these things we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Sorry, I got a text from Miss Menifee. All right. Let's go to uh, the epistle of Jude. Jude. Jude, and we'll, we'll, again, we'll start in verse number one. I won't go through, uh, I'm going to end up touching on it anyway as I go through the, the exposition of the verses, uh, verses 17 through 19, but I'm not going to stop a whole lot as we go through uh, reading the scripture all the way from verses one, and I'm going to read down through verse number 23. Um, but um, I do want to read the entire text. Uh, again, there's only 25 verses in the entire epistle, but I do want to read the entire text just so we can be brought back into uh, the context of where Jude is writing. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority 
but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people, verse 10, blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. In Cain, Balaam, and Korah mentioned there. We'll see those again tonight. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. And then last week's text. It was also about these, these who have crept in unaware, unnoticed, the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires, they are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. And I'll go ahead and read those final two verses. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So as we look to Jude, we see a term when we get to verse number 17. He begins by saying, but you. Now, to really understand and, and to grasp where we're at, um, he says, but you, there is, he has covered, and everything he has talked about going back to even verse number four was dealing with these certain people who have crept in unnoticed. And every description that he has from verse number four all the way down through verse number 16 is dealing with these people that have, that have crept in, that have slipped into the church unnoticed. Um, and let me, let me say this. I had a question earlier today uh, regarding these that crept in. And, and the question was along the lines of, are, are these teachers or are these lay persons or are they both? And the truth is that they are both. Uh, and to give a little exposition on that, because we do talk a lot about false teachers, and we use that term teachers and false prophets, and we don't take away those that are in leadership positions uh, that are leading uh, churches, denominations, uh, seminaries, Christian colleges uh, that have forsaken the truth and departed from the faith and are now uh, teaching an ungodly heresy. Um, 
we don't deny that. We don't take away from that. But it's also included that there are lay people. And here's what I point to. I point to uh, the example of Korah uh, in Numbers chapter number 16. Uh, Korah again rebelled against God and he had about 250 chiefs from the tribes of Israel uh, that came alongside of him. So there was leadership there, those that influence. Uh, and as he rebelled against Moses and the authority of Moses given to him by God, um, we find that he was judged, that the earth opened up and swallowed them all up. And of course, Jude makes mention of Korah's rebellion in verse number 11. But following after that, it wasn't just the leaders, but a lot 14,700, almost 15,000 of the people of Israel, when they saw the judgment that, that fell upon uh, those 250 men, and, and as well as Korah, they began to criticize and grumble against Moses, saying that Moses has killed uh, the people of the Lord. They recognized these who were in rebellion against God uh, they recognized them as people of the Lord. Uh, so they were people. So they were, there were lay people uh, that were contrary. And because of their grumbling, uh, there was a plague that came and, and killed 14,700 that were actually killed um, as a result of the plague. So when we talk about those that, that, that Jude is speaking to, and these who have crept in unnoticed, yes, they have crept into the pulpits. They have crept into the leadership positions in cemeteries and professorships of, sem of cemeteries, <laughs> seminaries. Um, uh, they are, they're in our, our Christian colleges, and they're also sitting in the pews. Uh, the practical way to describe it is this. Uh, we have been called to make disciples. That's the commission that is given unto, unto the church. And that commission of making disciples is not um, is not uh, limited to the pastors and it's limited to the teachers and elders and, and seminary professors. The call to make disciples is given to everybody, the entire church. It's a call to all of us. It's a commission to all of us. Likewise, those who are in opposition, those who have crept in unaware, in the same way that we are making disciples, not just from the pulpit, but we are making uh, disciples in the trenches of life uh, and in the pews uh, with those that, we, that that God has placed in our circle. Satan, likewise, in, in a copying manner, he is doing the same thing. He has placed people in our pews, in our churches uh, that make a profession of faith in Christ. Uh, but you find that, that uh, their character, we find that their works uh do not match their lips. Uh, they honor with their lips, uh, we would see in the Old Testament, but their hearts are, are far from him. So there were there when we talk about these who have crept in unaware, we're not just talking about teachers, we're talking about lay people as well. And these that come in, they draw no attention to themselves. Uh, they don't alarm others. Uh, I liken that to considering uh, Genesis chapter number three, uh, the serpent was in the garden. When the woman saw the serpent, she wasn't alerted. She wasn't alarmed. She had seen it before. It wasn't anything that, that would that would draw her attention or scare her or uh, or make her point or and, and put a draw a line. There was nothing about that serpent that, that was that was saying, I am against God. It was what he said, it was what he taught that exposed who he was. Um but the serpent himself was not there to all. He was very subtle and began to speak to the woman and, and the woman continued to uh, began to speak back uh, to him without any alarm. So these that crept in, they're not drawing attention to themselves. They are not, uh, uh, they are uh, not trying to alarm anyone, but they, they look and sound. Uh, they act in a lot of ways, religious, uh, but yet they have a profession of Christ, but they are not believers in Christ. And we'll talk about that continuing on. Uh, but their actions actually distinguish. And we see that in Jude, uh, verse number four. Uh, they are ungodly people. Okay, so they are anti-God. They are antinomian because they pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. Uh, consider what grace was intended for. Grace uh, was given unto us that we might be able to live holy and unbl and, and, and blameless. Um if we did not have grace, we would still be living in slavery, we'd still be living into the passions of our own lust, rescued us 
from that bondage. He has rescued us from being dead in trespasses and sins. He has breathed life into us by his grace. And that grace, the purpose behind it, Ephesians chapter number one, uh, three and four, is that we will live holy and we will be blameless. That's the purpose. That's the intention behind grace. It's not that we can live however we want to. It's not that we can live uh, according to whatever lust that we have, whatever passions that we have without any regard to condemnation or recourse from God. Grace was given unto us that we might live how we ought to live. Okay. It's not that we live however we want. So let's understand the purpose behind grace. Um, I was looking in, in Romans chapter number eight here recently and, and looking at how those that are of the flesh and those that are of the spirit, they set their minds on the flesh. They set their minds on the spirit. Um, these that have perverted the grace of our Lord into sensuality, they set their mind on the flesh. They set their mind on the things of the world where the believer would set his mind on the things of Christ and the, and the things of, of God. So, we find that these, these people have crept in unawares. They've been designated for condemnation. He goes through how uh, they have been written down in the Old Testament. He gives the examples in verses number uh, uh, five down through verse number seven, uh, describing these that, that have, have left their estate. They weren't content. They murmured in Israel. The angels prior to the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, they weren't content with where God had appointed them and what God had appointed them to do. They rebelled and were judged because of it. Their religion, their belief system is described in eight verses 8 through 10. They rely on dreams. Their authority is not in the word of God. Their authority is based upon self-revelation. Okay? They defile the flesh. They're sensual. They reject authority. They blaspheme holy ones. Okay, and they blaspheme what they do not understand. Look, if you will, to Second Peter, uh, chapter number three. I'll give you a few minutes to turn there. Second Peter, chapter number three. As it's a parallel epistle, again describing these that uh, that Paul has been speaking to uh, before verse number seventeen. Second Peter, chapter number three, and verse number fourteen. We'll start there. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting these, for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. Here we go. Listen. Which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the air of lawless people and lose your own stability. These people, verse number 16, they're ignorant and unstable and twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. These people and Jude, they reject authority and they blaspheme holy ones. They even blaspheme things they do not understand. And I want to look at the, understand they are ignorant, okay? These are words that, Paul, that Peter uses. Uh, that means they're unlearned or untaught. Now, that doesn't mean, listen, that doesn't mean that they are stupid. That doesn't mean that they are, you know, they haven't had any education whatsoever. They can't add three and five together. Um, when he says they're unlearned and untaught, it means they're unlearned and untaught by the Spirit of God. These false teachers, they're smart. Satan, no different in, in the garden in Genesis chapter number three. It wasn't that he was ignorant. It wasn't that he was untaught or unlearned. He knew. He knew. He was smart. He was very cunning, very subtle. These false teachers are very cunning. They are very subtle. Okay. They're not stupid. Okay. But they are unlearned and untaught of the spirit. And as such, they're unstable. They're chasing doctrine. Whatever the new teaching is, they're going to follow after that for a while. Once the new teaching comes along, they'll have to change their teaching and move it to another direction to begin to teach or encompass something else, uh, a new teaching or a new doctrine. Uh, and therefore, they're, unstate, they're unsteady. They're unstable in their ways. And what they have to do is they end up, because they look to the Scripture, they will twist the Scripture. And I, this word is great. It means to torture. 
It means to place upon the rack. They're stretching it and they're twisting the scripture. They're twisting and turning the words, whatever they can possibly do to make the scripture say what they want it to say. So it supports what their doctrines are, what their teachings are. They twist the scripture. So this is how Peter describes this blasphemy. Um, back to Jude. <clears throat> back to Jude in, in verses number 8 through 10. Of course, they, they reject authority. Uh, Peter says that they blaspheme the, the things that they do not understand. And they go. he goes on to say they're going to be judged in verse number 14 and so on down through verse number 16. God is coming to judge. And that's where he comes to verse 17 to say, but you. He's been talking about these false teachers, these who have been crept in unaware, but that was not the purpose of his epistle. Do you remember the purpose of his epistle? The purpose of his epistle was not in verse 4 to show who the false teachers are, although he spends a lot of time doing that, and there's a reason there's a purpose for that. He's trying to stir them into action, but he says... The purpose for my writing this in verse number three, he says, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about the common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That's his purpose. That's his reason. Now he goes off on what we may say is a tangent describing these who have crept in unaware. But his purpose and his intention behind this epistle is to get the reader, get the listener, get the believer to contend, to contend for the faith. Now, he says, but you must remember beloved. You must remember beloved. He begins by saying and describing and reminding them that they are the beloved. That is in contrast to those who are under judgment that he describes in verses 4 through 16. Everything we have seen there is talks about judgment, condemnation, wrath, damnation, all of these things that are cast upon these people that have crept in, that are ungodly, uh, that defy the very authority of God. And then he says, but you, you are beloved. You are beloved. Now, we've seen this word already before. We saw it back in verse number 1. It's how he began to describe those who he's ministering to. He says, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. They are beloved in God, called by the Spirit, kept for Jesus Christ. There you see the Trinity uh, exposed, expounded as Jude begins to write. And he says, you have been beloved in God. Before the foundation of the world, God foreloved you. He foreknew you. And he chose you out of the purpose of his own will to be holy and to be blameless. And everything that he has done is for your purpose, is for your glory. It's, it's, it's for your salvation. He's called you and he's kept you in Jesus Christ. And consider that. The reason he says you've been beloved by God consider this. How much has God invested in us? God has invested his entire being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three in one have been invested into you, the believer. You are the beloved of God. All things work together for good for those that love God, for those who are called according to his purpose we be conformed to the image of his son. Everything is working together. He has invested everything, every event, every trial, every tribulation, every joy, whether it be something personal, whether it be something uh, national, all of these things are working together for his purpose. He says, you're beloved. You're not damned. You're not judged. You're not under condemnation. Paul writes in, in uh, uh, Romans chapter number, he says, there, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are beloved. And he points that out at the very beginning. He says, you're different. You're different from these who are, who are under the condemnation that have been exposed in the Old Testament. Uh, those that are coming to receive or that are going to receive the judgment of God. 
He says, you're different. You are beloved. And he says, you must remember the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we get into this, let me point this out again. The purpose of this epistle is that they are to contend for the faith. And let me go back and dig into this a little more. It's been a while since we've looked at verse number three. And I know I have a lot of new people here. Um, but, but let's look at this word contend. I want us to understand what this means. Um, it means it means to agonize. It means to strive to obtain. Um, the word actually comes from the word agon, which means arena or assembly. Uh, when he uses this word, it would almost it, people would visualize someone uh, that is competing in a contest, in an Olympic game, so to speak, uh, wrestling or fighting uh, or competing in any sort of manner. Uh, they agonize over it. They they strategize over it. They they are they're they're aggressive within it, and they're doing it in front of a large audience. Um, this is the picture that that you see. He's trying to get them to contend. For the faith, the scripture we looked at last week, and we're going to look at it again tonight, deals with 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And if you want to go ahead and turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, let's look there once again. Uh, and we've referenced it a lot as we've gone through Jude, uh, because I think it does expose uh, the heart and mind of where Jude is, as well as where Paul was. Let's look at the first four verses once again. He says, I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. This is 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Let me stop for a second. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 1. He says, I wish you would bear with me a little in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. He's talking to the church at Corinth here. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Uh, there's the word, I think, in the King James was, was simplicity, a oneness there, a pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. People come in, they preach a different Christ, another Jesus. They come in, you receive a different spirit, uh, you accept a different gospel, and you just put up with it. You're okay with it. You don't contend against it. You just let it take its course. You see some heresy, see some issues, see some problems with it. Doesn't exactly uh, uh, g-haw, I guess is the word I would use, with what I have heard and what, what you, the Apostle Paul, has, has preached to us and told us. But I don't want to rock the boat. I've got a herd mentality and I don't want to disrupt the herd. We just put up with it. We just bear it. It can't be that bad. That's what Paul is dealing with in the church at Corinth. He was also dealing with the church at Galatia. This is what Jude is afraid of. He wants to stir them to contend, to get out there and to fight, to get out there and to agonize for the faith, for that common salvation. He doesn't want them, and here's the word we use that I we use it as coaches a lot, uh, uh, ERWs. Uh, we have so many church members that are what we call ERWs. You think of a football player, and we got so many of them. You got 85 players on a football team. Some of them will never see the field in four years, and they're okay with that. They like to eat the pregame meal. There's the E. They like to ride the bus. There's the R. And they like to wear the jersey because everybody likes the man in the football jersey. That's all they like. They just, they're okay. And some people use W to say, watch the game. They're okay with that. They're okay with just being on the team, getting all the privileges and perks of being a football player or basketball player or whatever it may be, but not willing or not desiring to compete and contend. ERWs, that's what we call. There's a lot of ERWs within the body of Christ, within the church. They see what's going on. They see there's an enemy. There's a see there's a war to fight. There's a battle there, but they're content. They just put up with it. That's what Jude's after. That's what Jude is concerned with. That's the reason as he begins to write about the common salvation, 
he began, he turns, the spirit turns his mind and says, I'm writing that you will contend for the faith. To contend for the faith. Now, that begs the question. It really brings us into uh, verses 17 through 19. Again, he's turned his object of his discussion to the you, to the church, to them. His purpose is to get them to contend for the faith. These verses, verses 17 down through verse number 23, give us the how. He doesn't just say, go out there and fight. Let's go ahead and duke it out. Let's go ahead and let, let's contend. Let's fight. Let's grapple for it and then leave it at that. No, he says, here's how we do it. Like a good teacher, like a good coach. Uh, he doesn't just say, or, or a great commander, I guess you'd say. He doesn't just say, go out and fight the war. He tells them how the fight is to be fought. And this is what we see in verses 17 all the way down through verse number 23. And that's what we're going to look at uh, the next couple of weeks regarding this contending. Now, the first thing he does is, but you, again, talking to the beloved, distinguishing them, separating them from those he had been describing in the previous verses. He says, you must remember the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ they said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. The first thing to do regarding contention when we are contending is we have to remember the very word of God. We have to remember what the apostles have already proclaimed. Okay, To remember, to call to mind these predictions, these prophecies, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. These predictions, these spoken words given by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving them an authority. Okay, these were not just men. These were those who were sent of Jesus Christ himself. Okay, and the word that they gave, the predictions that they gave was that there will, in the last time, there will be scoffers. These that have crept in unaware, God is not taken by surprise. God is not alarmed. And in turn, we should not be either. We should actually expect it. Why would it be any different today as opposed to the times of Moses, the times of Noah, the times of Lot? Why would it be any different today as it was back then? The same battle that has been fought in the Garden of Eden is still being fought today regarding false teachers. But yet, whenever we see this false teaching, the worry and the concern is that the believer might say, well, God's not in control anymore. How could he allow this to happen? Why is he allowing these false teachers to, to be in our pulpits, to be in our seminaries, to, to be in our pews? Why is he allowing this to happen? Stirring up division, stirring up strife. God knew. God ordained. God's not caught by surprise. And he says, remember that because this is what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is what they said to you. They said in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Now let's talk about that term last time, last time. In a lot of evangelical circles, when you see that word last time, or you see the term last days, uh, we immediately start thinking to that period, either in the tribulation or just prior to the tribulation, uh, we're getting close to it, and that's when these things are going to happen. But we need to understand that when they write and say the term last time or last days, that's not what their intention is, that's not what their purpose is. Last time covers everything between the first advent of Christ and the second advent of Christ. These are the last times. And I want us to look at a couple of scriptures that help expound that a little bit. Well, first, let's go to Hebrews chapter number one. Hebrews chapter number one, just a few pages to the left. I'll wait just a second. Give me a drink of water. Hebrews chapter number 
1, excuse me, I might have said 11, Hebrews chapter number 1, number 1, verse number 1. He says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. In the Old Testament, that's how God spoke to us. He spoke to the prophets. The prophets wrote it down. They spoke to us. Okay. Many times, many ways. But in these last days, not the days of the tribulation, not the days that are to come, not in the days just before his second coming, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Okay, so the last days points there as not days that are to come, but in these last days, these last times, between the time of his first advent and his second advent, God speaks to us by his son. Another scripture to look at is, uh, look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy chapter number three, verse number one. Again, we'll probably come back to this at some point uh, in looking at these uh, these scoffers and muckers. But uh, Second Timothy chapter number three. But understand this, verse one, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, holy, heartless, un unappeasable, slanderous, without self control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Okay? This is not something that is still to come. This is something that Paul saw in his day. Paul saw it in, uh, uh, Timothy saw it in his day. We see it in our day. Uh, this is these are not, not a description that, that is something that's going to come some other time, but this is the last days even today. And let's look at one more. First John chapter number two. First John chapter number two. First John chapter number two and looking at verse number 18. First John 2, 18. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. It is the last hour. Okay? Didn't say it's coming. Didn't say it's down the road somewhere. Okay? He says it is. Now, it's the last hour. And as you have heard the Antichrist is coming, so have now many Antichrists have come. So understand when Jude is talking about these last times or these prophets or these apostles, excuse me, um, say that in the last time there will be scoffers. They're talking about right now, the time between the first advent and the second advent of Christ. Okay, so these apostles, the question is, and just to, who are these apostles? Now, there are some, when you look at the wording, it's almost as if, and probably so, that maybe Peter himself had actually come and spoke to these men, uh, actually taught them, um, you know, this, this church itself. Uh, the way that it's written, so they said to you, uh, and the, the it's in the imperfect tense that they said over and over and over again. This was their teaching when they were here. Uh, and the fact that this wording uh, is almost synonymous with Second Peter, uh, chapter number three. Second Peter, chapter number three, says in verse number two, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of our of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Uh, almost identical words, the actual word scoffing there, uh, mockers, it's only used twice in the New Testament, the only two times, Jude and Second Peter. Uh, so it's as if, as we've seen before, Second Peter gave the prophecy uh, a few months, maybe a year before, and then Jude begins to write and say, do you remember what Peter told us? Remember what Peter said? He said it was going to be just like this. Um, so he says to you, in last times there will be scoffers. But let's not just hold it to just Peter himself. This is not something that just Peter had alluded to or that Peter had given the prediction of. Christ himself, uh, and we're going through the gospel of, of Mark, in Mark chapter number 13, verse 5, we just came through that chapter a few weeks ago. Um, in Mark chapter number 13, he says there's going to be those that say, here's Christ, there's Christ. 
uh, teaching of a false Christ, a false salvation. Why? Because calamities around. All the calamity that's described in verse chapter number 13, people are looking for a savior. They're looking for some type of answer, much like we have today. Uh, calamity is around on a much smaller scale than what you're going to see uh, during that time. But even then, people are looking for a savior. They're looking for an answer. Uh, they're looking for someone to, to bring a solution. Um, so therefore, people are going to present some type of false Christ, some type of false salvation. Uh, there are scoffers, jokers, uh, mockers, childish people, okay, who according to, and, and let's go on to some of the other apostles, we'll say this, Paul, Paul speaks to this, these mockers that are kind of coming the last time. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter number 20, some very good scripture here, Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20, and let's start in verse number 28. Acts 20, verse 28. All right. Pay careful attention, Paul writes. This is to the Ephesian elders. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Take care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, sounds a lot like Jude verse number four. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Okay, so he says, as soon as I leave, as soon as I head off to, to my next mission field, after my departure, fierce wolves are going to come in among you. Uh, men will arise from among you, speaking twisted things, drawing away disciples after themselves. So Paul says that these false teachers are going to come. Let's look at another verse from Paul. Let's look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. I've already seen uh, Corinth in chapter number 11. Let's look in uh, chapter number 4, 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 4. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. It says the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith. Paul writes this. And let's look at a couple more. Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter number three. And we saw this before. And we'll just read the first verse there. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self and so on. Uh, going down to verse number six, for among them, are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray with various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Sounds a lot like what Peter said, that they are ignorant and unstable and twist the, twist the scriptures. Okay, so these are, are have been predicted by Paul. And of course, the famous words there in chapter number four of 2 Timothy, he says in verse number three, he says, for the time is coming, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Okay, so these false teachers that Jude mentions, these, these prophecies or uh, teachings of the apostles that Jude brings to their memory, uh, Christ spoke of it, Peter spoke of it, Paul spoke of it, even John 
Uh, let's just look at, I'll just look at one verse. Well, let's look at all three of them. John chapter number four. They're good. Beloved, do not believe. This is verse one, 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out, even in his day, have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is 1 John 4, is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now is in the world already. And let's look at his second epistle. Verse number 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. And in his last epistle, the third, his third epistle, uh, in verses number nine down through 11, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us and not content with that. He refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to, to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whosoever does good is from God. Whosoever does evil has not seen God. And this is, that's John. So we've seen it from Christ, Peter, Paul, John, they all these apostles say that these scoffers are going to come, and Jude points out that they're going to follow their own ungodly passions. They're going to follow their own ungodly passions. Now, Paul is reminding them this is to be expected, not to be uh, concerned about, not to be worried about, uh, not to be dejected about, but we ought to be encouraged about that. Because as God said it would happen, the prophecy is being fulfilled. It's one more assurance that we have uh, in the word of God. So as we are contending for the faith, we have to remember this is exactly how God said it would be. We have to expect a battle. Uh, when we come together to worship, when we are out in, in the world, when we are uh, in, our, uh, in our families and, and, and in our places of business and in our schools, we have to expect this battle. Don't think that, hey, there's somebody teaching something besides Christ. Don't be surprised by that. Don't be taken off guard by that. God said it would be just like this. So we have to have, if we're going to contend uh, the way that Jude wants us to contend, we have to have an awareness that the enemy is there. He's going to present himself. Don't be taken off guard by it. Don't be shocked by it when you see these teachers on television or you see teachers in the pulpit or you read, see books and commentary by books. Don't be surprised by that. It's to be expected because the prophet said it would be like this. Second thing, here's what they say. They say, last times there'll be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Uh, they're going to live after their own self. They're going to live after their own uh, ungodly lust, antinomian we've spoken of, verse number 19. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Now, we have to go into life and into our daily routine, into, our, into the battle, knowing that the enemy's there. He's in the arena. He's ready to fight. Okay? We have to have that attitude. We're contending. We have to have that attitude. The second thing we have to be able to do is we have to be able to identify the enemy. It's interesting when you think about the evolution of, of, of warfare. And I read a lot of history books and I watch a lot of uh, things on the History Channel and things of, of that nature, old wars and things like that. And I find it interesting that in the old days of warfare, uh, I was watching a series on the Revolutionary War here recently. You know, the, the Continentals wore the blue coats and the British wore the red coats. Uh, very easy to discern what side you were on and who the enemy is. Uh, and even if it was some type of militia that made that might have been a farmer or might have been a lower end that didn't have the red coat or the blue coat, if they're pointing a gun to you, they're not on your side. 
it was very easy for the most part to figure out who the enemy was and to know who the friends were. Uh, but as warfare has evolved, we've seen that change. The Civil War, you saw blue and you saw gray. As you got into World War I, it was interesting. And I remember reading stories about this uh, when I was in college about uh, the French officers at the beginning of World War I were still wearing blue coats and white gloves. And the Germans would just mow them down with their machine guns. The warfare had changed, but their dress had not. Uh, they had to change how, how they did things. But now when you get into even past World War II and Vietnam, and now in this terrorist age in which we live, it's hard to distinguish who the enemy is and who the friend is. Uh, the issue that they had in, in Vietnam, and they even have uh, even over in, in our more recent wars in the last 20 years, uh, they're a friend by day. Uh, they don't attack you by day. They'll feed you by day, but then at night, you know, they, they'll attack. They'll, they'll set ambushes. They'll set bombs. Uh, you don't know whose side they're on. It's hard to distinguish the enemy. Much is the same in spiritual warfare, okay? Much is the same in spiritual warfare. We have to be able to distinguish the enemy. They're not going to come at us with red coats, okay? They're not going to come at us with white gloves saying, I am the enemy. Now that you see that somewhere and, and they're labeled, uh, we like to limit it to, to your cult, such as Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. They're, you can see them coming a mile away. They got their red coats on or their blue coats on. You can see them. These are those who have crept in unaware. Okay. They're dangerous because you don't see them coming. You can't identify them. And slowly but surely, like Balaam, they begin to entice people away from the truth ever so subtly. So when we're talking about contending, and this is the reason for the epistle, we have to remember and expect the battle, expect them to be there, but be able to identify. And that's what we see in verse number nine. He says, it is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. Cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit. Now, let's look at these phrases and we'll be done tonight. They cause divisions. Interesting word. In the Greek, it actually means to separate by appointing boundaries, to set classifications. Okay? They they separate, they set themselves apart differently. They create boundaries and classifications within the congregation, within the church. Now we see this, and, and we see this type of work described in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 10. Don't have to turn there. Uh, but Paul speaks of don't have divisions. It's contrary to the Word of God. Uh, Galatians 5.20 uh, we know Galatians 5, 22 and 23 speak to the fruit of the Spirit, but prior to the fruit of the Spirit, Paul writes and tells the church the works of the flesh. Within the works of the flesh is divisions. And we also find, and we've read it, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, they depart from the faith. They set some boundary uh, between them and truth. They set themselves apart. Now, let's just look at this, because I don't want us to just hold this. They do cause division. They do cause strife. But understand what the word Pharisee means. We see that word Pharisee, and we have this image of a Pharisee in our head. Maybe we've got it from watching TV or, or some special, um, seeing some picture on a flannel graph when we were eight or nine years old. But we have a picture of a Pharisee, but I want you to understand what that Pharisee means. It actually comes from a word meaning to set apart to set themselves apart. The Pharisees saw themselves at his elite. Okay? They put a division between them and the rest of Israel. These cause divisions. They set one class against another class, one people against another people. An elite religious class against a lower religious class. Divisions throughout. Okay, so when we consider the main action, the main action of these false teachers, they cause divisions. Consider the Cain, Balaam, Korah pathway. 
Look at back at verse number 11. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Kor's rebellion. There was a pathway there we exposed. Cain, going to do it his own way, his own religion. Balaam, going to entice people by sensuality, by the flesh, unto their own lust, unto his way. And then Korah, they eventually are simply standing in defiance against God. They've created their own religion. They've drawn people to their cause. And now they stand and defy the very authority and the very person of God. They have caused a division. They've set people against one another. Okay? They've defied the authorities. They blaspheme the holy ones, Jude says. So when we think about these, they are causing divisions. Now, Romans, Paul speaks to the Romans as they, their, their God is their belly. Okay, these that cause division, he says, mark them, stay away from it. He says, their God is their belly. The reason why they cause div divisions in that next word, they're worldly people. Worldly people, devoid of the spirit. And you can put these together. When it says they're worldly people, it means they are governed by the flesh. They are natural minded. They are not concerned with spiritual things. They're not concerned with eternity. They're not concerned with God. They are concerned with the here and they are concerned with the now. Okay. Let's look at Romans chapter number eight. I mentioned Romans eight earlier, and I want to go to it now just to kind of see this division take place. Romans chapter number eight, and start in verse number one. I'll give you a second. Give me a chance to get a drink. Got a few minutes left. Romans chapter number eight, verse one. There is therefore no condemn now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay, who's the us? Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse number five, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. They're worldly minded. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. These are those that Jude speaks of. They have set their mind on the flesh. They are carnally minded. Everything is about the here and the now. Okay? Uh, they are devoid. And I want to get back to a deeper description of this in a second. They are devoid of the spirit. That literally means, the Greek says, they do not have the spirit. They do not possess the spirit. God does not reside in them. Okay? They are not believers in Christ. They are not Christians. They are devoid of the Spirit. They do not have the Spirit of God. We as believers have the Spirit of God living within us. We are led by the Spirit. The Spirit convicts us. The Spirit chastens us. The Spirit guides us. The Spirit teaches us of Christ. We are sealed with that Spirit. It's that down payment of, of the inheritance that is to come. The believer has the Spirit living within him, and we are led by the Spirit of God. Worldly people are led by their flesh. They're naturally minded. Now, let's look at these three descriptions. They cause division, worldly people, and devoid of the Spirit. Let's kind of put them all together. Now, I hate to do it this way, and I hate to say it this way, because I think sometimes we, we say it, and it becomes white noise because you hear it so much in, in today's circles, especially in reform circles uh, and more conservative uh, areas of, of, of evangelicalism, uh, talking about the health uh, and prosperity gospel. It's right here in a nutshell. Okay? It's right here in a nutshell. They're worldly minded. They're not concerned about eternity. 
They're not concerned about the judgment of God. They're not concerned about holiness. They're not concerned about blamelessness. They're not concerned about being conformed to the image of his son. They're concerned about health and wealth and prosperity right now. They're concerned about things that's going to satisfy the flesh, satisfy fleshly lusts. That's what they're concerned with. And they cause divisions. They set themselves up in an elitist position. They, they, they hold themselves as we know something better than you. We have a greater revelation. We know something more than you. You who simply just teach the scripture, you who are stuck on salvation by grace through faith, you who are concerned about God and holiness and righteousness and be, living blameless, you who are concerned about being conformed to the image of your son, we are in a different category than you. We are in a different, a higher, a more righteous, a more accepted position than you. Okay, They have set themselves apart, causing divisions. Okay, It is these who cause divisions. And I, the reason I say I hate to say health and welfare is because that's the popular terminology that we've heard the last 20, 30, even 40 years ever since, you know, communication abilities has continued to increase and and false teachers have an easier way into your living room uh, than they did before. So it's very popular and, and that teaching is, is very well known and, and, and you see it over and over again um, because it does feed to the flesh. It is very sensual uh, and that's what people are. So people fall for or into it, but don't think that that's something that's new. This is no different than what you saw in the days of Paul. It's no different than what you saw uh, in, in the early church and in centuries past. You always have these antinomians. You always have those who, are, who, 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 who twist the grace of God into lasciviousness. Um, so when we want to identify them, that's what we're looking for. Worldly people, devoid of the Spirit, their mind is not set on the things of the Spirit. Their messages are not set upon the things of Christ, of preaching Christ and Him crucified. Uh, they are trying to draw based upon sensuality, like Balaam, trying to play upon your senses, trying to, to, to get your mind off of the eternal things and onto the carnal things of, of life and in this world. Um Anything, like I said, there are some people who are causing divisions, meaning they are teaching one thing that is contrary to the word of God, and that's going to cause a division. They're going to set themselves at a higher plane, a different plane. That's going to cause a division. And when you think about that and you consider that and compare that with what a true teacher would be, uh, what a true uh, pastor would teach, this is where we'll close. Let's go to Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. Verse number one. Ephesians chapter number four. And looking in verse number one, he says, I therefore, again, after he's talked about the position of the believer, talked about who we are, what God has done for us in salvation. Chapter number four, he begins to talk about our walk. In Christ, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One, 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 one. Unity, unity, unity. Now, verse number 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? What's the purpose of these men who lead and teach? to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, up the body of Christ, not dividing it, not tearing it down, but building it up until we all attain what? To the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves 
and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together to by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Unity into the oneness, into the fullness of Christ. Now, not unity for unity's sake, but unity for the sake of Christ. The unity of the truth, unity in true doctrine, unity uh, in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. This is how you identify a, a true teacher. Identify the false teacher just the opposite. They're preaching their own gospel. They're teaching their own way. They're causing divisions in the church as a result. They're worldly minded. They're not speaking to the gospel. When, and speaking, the, there are so many people that when you ask them what the gospel is, they don't know it. They don't understand it. They may think it's just a type of music. It's a, or it's a feel-good type of, of, of message. But we talk about the gospel. We start with God and his holiness and his righteousness. And we recognize his holiness and his righteousness and his wrath that is revealed against us. Because we as sinners can't stand in his presence. And he being a just God must judge. He must bring his wrath. His wrath must be satisfied. But for his elect, for his people, for the church, his wrath was satisfied. It was appeased by Jesus Christ on the cross. His wrath was poured out upon him. And our wrath, the wrath that was due unto us, was poured out on Christ. Our sin was imputed unto Christ. But not only that, his righteousness was imputed unto us. So we live by faith. His righteousness is not something we can gain by works, but it is something that is given unto us, graced unto us by faith. And for those who do not believe, they are still under condemnation. They are still under the wrath of God. And they, like those in Jude, they will be punished. The gospel is the good news that God has saved. He has made an atonement. He has appeased his wrath in his son. That's the gospel. It's not a feel-good message about life. It's not a message of, you know, I can live a better life tomorrow or I can have a better, my best life now is the common phrase you hear. Uh, in, in critique of, of health and welfare. But it is about a bigger picture of the wrath of God, the holiness of God. That's the message that must be taught. So two things before we depart tonight. When we disciple, that has to be what we disciple to. If we are going to be two, treacher, two true teachers, true disciples, we have to disciple to the gospel of Christ. That has to be the ultimate intent. That has to be the purpose of our discipleship. Not just to have a better life now, not just to give someone simply an encouragement for the sake of the encouragement, but our ultimate objective should be that the gospel of Christ is clearly presented. And the second thing is this. Just as Jude, we have to be able to identify these false teachers. We have to be able to identify these scoffers, causing divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Open our eyes. Take some time to consider the books that are on your bookshelf, uh, the programs that you watch on TV, though they may be listed as religious, uh, the teachers that you might listen to. Uh, be discerning as to what they're teaching what they're saying, what the end state is. And, and it may be something you may not pick up on right off the bat. Uh, but over time, as you begin to listen and you begin to understand and have discernment, uh, you begin to see some of the error 
that is being proclaimed in, in pulpits and being proclaimed of own uh, books, even on our own shelf and, and TV shows and teachers that we listen to. We have to be discerning about those things. Uh, I think that's one of the great challenges that we have is that we don't discern very well. Whatever someone teaches us, whatever someone says to us, we just take it at face value and we don't execute that Berean test from Acts and go back to the scripture, go back to the authority and see if it is true. Listen, you do that with every message that you hear. I don't care if it's me that says it. I don't care if it's Pastor Jackson that says it. I don't care where you heard some of in your ministry. I don't care where you heard the message at. We need to be discerning and go back to the scripture, go back to the word of God to see if that's what the scripture says. Make sure it's not just an opinion of man. I will uh, be around for, for a few minutes. I'll go ahead and close out in prayer, but I'll, I'll be around my phone here for the next few minutes. If you have a question that you'd like to ask. Um, and again, if you want to kind of wait, if you want to kind of get your thoughts around and think about things tonight, that's great. Ponder on some things and, and then ask uh, tomorrow or, or this weekend or whatever, as you begin to prayer, uh, prepare, because next week, Lord willing, we're going to pick up in verse number 20 and go through verse number 23. Um, Hopefully we'll get that far. We'll see. I think we will. Um, but uh, you start looking at that and you have questions even looking into next week. Please to, to ask. I encourage you to ask. Uh, a lot of times those questions you ask me, they keep keeps me on my toes. And it helps me to see kind of how you're thinking and issues that you're facing and, and how you see things. Uh, and, and just to make sure that we're looking at the Word of God as the Word of God is, is written. So, again, if you have questions, feel free to call, feel free to ask, uh, feel free to text, uh, either of those five. Thank you for being here tonight. It's been great. Uh, I hope that, uh, that it's been an encouragement to you. Uh, I hope it's been, thank you, uh, uh, Deacon McGavick. Um, I hope it's been encouragement to you. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot to see, and there's a lot to see next week because we want to talk about contending. How are we going to contend? What, how, how, how else do we contend for the faith? Know that the enemy's there. They're going to be there. Uh, know that, uh, be able to identify them, be discerning about it. Next week, we're going to talk about preparing yourself as a soldier and then talking about the evangelization, uh, the evangelization piece. Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your mercy, Lord, that we have seen over the course of the last few days and the last few months. Uh, Lord, that you, that you have, have kept us safe, uh, Lord, and Lord, that's simply by your mercy, Lord. You don't have to do that, Lord. If you want to see fit that a tornado take us out, Lord, you can do that. If you want to see fit that one of us comes down with, with a virus, you can do that. You're sovereign. It's all in your hands. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, Lord, toward us today. We thank you for your mercy and salvation, uh, Lord, that you have sent your son. Lord, he has appeased your wrath. Lord, he has atoned for our sins, Lord, and that his righteousness uh, is our righteousness. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you so much, Lord, for, for the wisdom and the understanding of the word of God that you grant us, for your spirit who lives and resides within us, leading us, teaching us, guiding us, convicting us, uh, and drawing us unto you. So Lord, I pray that as we continue to consider this contention and how to contend, give us greater understanding. Help us to recognize that we are in a battle, that there is enemies' presence. Lord, they're on our bookshelves, they're in our pews, they're in our churches. Help us to recognize that those enemies are there. And Lord, help us to be discerning, to understand and recognize them, um, to know who they are, to identify them. And Lord, as we go ahead next week, Lord willing, Lord, I pray that that you would help us to understand what we must do to prepare as, as we fight. And then the actions that we must take uh, as we are contending for that faith. Lord, we thank you once again for the privileges that you've given us. Thank you for the blessings that you have given us. Lord, even though we do we take them so often for granted, Lord, forgive us. Lord, be with us as we go our separate ways. Lord, as we contemplate your scripture, knowing that all of the power, all of the glory, all of the majesty, all of the dominion belongs to you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.